So uh, before we start, uh, let me uh, make a brief introduction and then give the podium to Asis. Well, everybody, I assume that uh, everybody is hearing me sound and clear, right? Okay. Yeah. Okay, ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the Lara webinars where logic and religion interact in biblical proportion. As a member of the scientific board of the Logic and Religion Association, I have been asked to provide a brief introduction to the association and this webinar series for those who might be joining us for the first time. Well, the Logic and Religion Association, LARA, which has been founded in 2021, is yet another gift of the Brazilian logic community to the world, besides our consistent logic and the UNESCO World Logic Day, which, by the way, will be celebrated all around the globe tomorrow on January 14th. LARA aims to advance research in the field of logic and religion through various uh, congresses and events, such as the World Congresses of Logic and Religion. The next one will be in Varanasi, India in November 2022, and workshops on topics such as oriental logic and spirituality in the modern age, uh, as well as through the publication of manuscripts. Here in the LARA webinars, we plan to search for answers to questions such as, uh, do certain theorems and concepts in logic have metaphysical implications? What contribution can logic as an academic a uh, field provide to the philosophical reflection on God and religion? Uh, could this uh, contribution extend to other dimensions of the study of uh, religion, such as the sociology and anthropology of religion? Can a uh, logic contribute to bringing religion closer to rationality? On the other hand, in what sense can religion bring new insights to the study of uh, study and development of logic? Uh, can we talk about logic and religion as a new field of research? If so, what is the peculiar about uh, this field at, that differentiates it from other areas, areas of research, both in terms of methodology and object of study? Is it a uh, multidisciplinary, interdisciplinary, of, uh, or transdisciplinary research field? Finally, I would like to use the opportunity to sincerely thank my friends and colleagues, Ricardo Silvestre and jean yves Bizet, the president and vice president of LARA for the initiative, as well as uh, all other colleagues in the administrative and scientific board of the organization for contributing to this global effort. I also extend my gratitude to all the participants and, other, uh, and our distinguished speaker, Professor Kelly Clark, for joining us today. So without further ado, I would like to give the podium to my friend Assis Mariano, who is uh, going to chair the session. Assis, please start. <clears throat> Thank you, Ali. Thank you everyone for being here. Um, I just want to express my gratitude to be here and the gratitude to welcome uh, everyone to hear Professor Kelly Clark um, talk. He's going to talk about the logic of biblical love. He's um, an American philosopher of religion. He has contributed a lot, especially in the field of cognitive science of religion. He's currently a distinguished professor of philosophy at Hulu University in Istanbul. He has um, several publications in both in the field of interfaith, and, and cognitive science of religion. Um, his last book is God and the Brain, a strange, uh, Strangers, Neighbors, Friends. Um, so these are maybe the best, um, the, the most noted uh, known of his books. So without any further ado, I want to give the floor to Professor Carol Clark. He's going to speak for about uh, 45 minutes and then um, you're welcome to send any um, questions that you have. I'm going to organize myself the questions. You can either write in the chat or you can just speak for yourself after his talk, okay? Professor Carol Clark, the floor is yours. Okay, thank you very much, and thank you to everyone for the invitation. Uh, I'm really grateful in uh, this day and age when we're all probably mostly working at home uh, to have the chance to connect with some people, and it looks like people from all over the world. 
uh, thank you for this kind invitation. Uh, some of you may know that I do a lot of work, um, interfaith work. I use academic projects to try to bring Muslims, Christians, and Jews together, uh, mostly in the Middle East. Um, and um, I, I was asked a couple of years ago to write a book on uh, different Abrahamic perspectives on love. Uh, and the book is almost done. I've written on love in the Christian tradition, love in the Abrahamic tradition, sorry, love in the Jewish tradition and love in the Islamic tradition. Uh, and I've learned an enormous amount about it. And I, I think, and the answer should be obvious, I, I've learned the most about my own Christian tradition um, through doing this. And I, I thought I knew a, a lot about the, the logic of love, the terms of love, uh, how love goes with other um, uh, theological uh, topics or theological themes um, in the New Testament, uh, how love was ex ex explicated in the Christian tradition. Uh, and, and I figured out I didn't know that much about it. And I also figured out, I think, that a lot of what um, passes for the most famous scholarship on love in the Christian tradition I, I think a lot of it's just wrong. And uh, if not wrong, um, it's not helpful. And I'll, I'll try to make the point about how it's not helpful in just a little bit. Uh, in some ways, I'm just gonna be talking about uh, meanings of terms. Uh, I'm trying to give a lay of the land here. Um, and I think there's a lot more that needs to be done and could be done and, and could and should be done by philosophers as they develop a logic of biblical love. Um, this is uh, sort of an early, I think, geography of love in the Christian tradition. And, um, and we have to see the lay of the land before we can begin uh, doing much conceptual analysis or looking for implications or trying to figure out consequences of love. Uh, I want to, oh, here we go. It worked and then it didn't work. There we go. I want to start with, um, with looking at how philosophers in the Christian tradition have come to understand love. And I found the exact same thing in the Jewish traditions. Uh, you'll find the same thoughts, for example, in Maimonides and uh, similar thoughts in thinkers in the Islamic tradition. And that is, um, what you find is that, um, is that there are sort of two different gods that you find, um, at least uh, gods by description, in the authoritative texts of each tradition, uh, and then in what people say, what theologians and philosophers say later about their traditions. And of course, the most famous um, by a uh, biographical way to raise this point is with uh, the story of pa Blaise Pascal. And um, as many of you know, Pascal had a, an experience of God later on in his life. And he wrote about it. And he wrote um, on a piece of paper, what we read here. And he put this had this piece of paper sewn into a jacket so it would be next to his heart for the rest of his life. And he said his experience was like this, fire, God of Abraham, God of Isaac, God of Jacob, not of the philosophers and scholars. Certitude, certitude, feeling, joy, peace. Thy God shall be my God, joy, 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 tears of joy. And so we find here contrasted the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, with the God of the philosophers and scholars. And um, I, I put it here a little bit um, differently. I talk about the God of the text or the God of the traditions uh, in my work on it. And um, the argument I wanna make here is I think the God of the traditions, what Pascal calls the God of the philosophers and the God of the scholars, is not really very useful in helping human beings understand how human beings should love other human beings. Uh, 
in the Christian tradition, and I suspect in the Jewish and Islamic tradition as well, we're told that we're supposed to love like God. And yet I found the God of traditions, one that's not, um, that's not, uh, uh, or cannot be a good model for human beings in their love of other human beings. Or if, if that sort of God is a model, then I want to say it's a deficient model for how a human beings should love. Maybe it's a great model for how God should love, but it's a deficient model for how human beings should love. And as we look at the God of the tradition, so I have here an image of Aquinas on the top and Augustine on the bottom, um, they take their view of the divine, heavily influenced by uh, Aristotle um, as the God, the first mover, the first and unmoved mover. We find in Latin a different phrase, God is actus purus. God can act, but cannot be acted upon. Um, God can affect things, but nothing affects God. There's nothing in the world that happens that can have any impact on God whatsoever. And um, corollaries of these views are that God is immutable, that God cannot change. And uh, on this view, God cannot change in any respect whatsoever. God does not, for example, acquire information based on what happens in the world. So God can't change with respect to knowledge. Um, uh, even though God is sometimes portrayed in the Hebrew Bible as uh, not knowing the future or, um, uh, or sometimes even getting upset at actions that uh, usually the Hebrews um, have or, uh, or other tribes uh, have, um, God cannot, God gets angry, for example. So God changes with respect to his emotional states. Uh, God acquires information. So has a change in knowledge. Uh, God um, gets upset and so has a change of emotion. God changes his plans. So God's desires change um, according to a kind of natural, the most natural reading of the Hebrew Bible but the God of the traditions is a God who cannot change. All of that is mere anthropomorphism. They don't describe anything that goes on truly within the divine nature. It may appear to humans that God has changed, but in fact, it's impossible for God to change. And uh, again, a corollary of immutability is impassibility, uh, where we get the, our word pathos or passions. Uh, it's not that God has no pathos or passions on this view. It's that God has no upsetting emotions. Um, there's nothing that can happen in the world that could possibly make God uh, change in any respect and, and in respect to his uh, emotions. So on this view, again, God, it's not that God has no emotions in being impass impassable, but God has no upsetting emotions he doesn't really get angry in response to things that happen in the world. Um, he doesn't really get jealous um, when um, people turn away from him and the like. So on this view, God is in a state of perpetual, unperturbable bliss. Uh, 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 Aristotle goes so far as to think God can only be thinking of uh, himself uh, because only he uh, can ground this state of perpetual, unperturbable bliss. Um, you might think God just thinks, uh, or that God thinks um, only of God's thoughts, and God's thoughts are that God uh, knows everything about the world, and everything about the world in its totality is uh, good or beautiful. And so nothing that happens in the meantime um, the tragic death of a child or something more massive uh, like the Holocaust, none of that can, um, uh, none of that can, has, can impinge in any way whatsoever on God's uh, emotional state. God's emotional state is perpetual, unperturbable bliss. Well, then you can imagine the, consequences of this view of God 
for divine love. Because on this view, God can't have compassion or empathy. God can't feel with us or uh, or care for us in, in ways for human beings that are episodic, that re require us to see someone who's, uh, uh, who's suffering and be moved by that. And not just move to feel in a certain way, but to have our feelings move us to act in certain ways. God, on this view, cannot have compassion or uh, empathy. So God, so we have to understand God's love then uh, in terms of God's essential nature. So on this view, God loves in the mode of benevolence. God wills good things for all human beings. God wills good things for all human beings, um, but not in response to uh, the acquisition of new knowledge or not in response to the acquisition of new feelings that move God to act. God is in a perpetual state of benevolence, willing good things for human beings. And um, I'll, I'll go into the next. The God of the text, though, and, and the natural and most straightforward reading of the Bible, has God looking at the suffering of God's people, and God seems moved to act. I've seen your suffering and I'm moved by your prayers, and I have come down. So it looks like on the natural, most straightforward reading of the Bible, and then we can look at a whole series of images that are used to describe this. God is described at various times as a father, and loving us like a father, as a friend, and loving us like a friend, uh, as a mother, and loving us like a mother, uh, as a shepherd and caring for us like a shepherd, if one sheep is lost, uh, he he leaves the rest and goes and finds that one sheep and brings him back or brings it back. Um, you might think in this day and age that sheep lives matter um, uh, to God. God is a bridegroom and he uh, loves us like we're his bride and welcomes us as his bride. And <clears throat> God is a hen in a couple of passages and wants to gather his chicks under his wings. Um, and again, on the natural, most straightforward reading of the Bible, God changes and does not know the future. I take it this is most uh, representative of uh, what we read in uh, what Christians call the Old Testament, but uh, in the Hebrew Bible, it looks pretty clearly like God the Father changes, God the Father doesn't know the future. And of course, um, Jesus changes, and Jesus doesn't know the future, but I'm not going to get into uh, any Christological controversies here. And it looks like God cannot do certain things and is dependent on creatures in various ways uh, for emotional states and for will, uh, what God intends to do. And in the most straightforward reading, God is grieved, gets angry, and is happy all of this in response to events that happen in the world. This is what we read in the God of the texts. And, um, uh, and what we see in the God of the texts is that God's love is empathy and compassion. God doesn't just will good things. God feels certain things in response to things that happen in the world and is moved by those things that God feels, is moved to act. And um, I, I think empathy and compassion are, um, I, I don't separate these out very well yet. I haven't um, thought much exact, uh, about exactly what they are. I, I take empathy to be a sort of uh, sympathetic feeling, um, feeling the suffering of another in some way and being moved by that uh, feeling um, to act. Uh, you can be empathetic and not act, but I think uh, uh, empathy is a, uh, an essential feature of love in its highest form, not just acting on behalf of other human beings, but, but having the right uh, effective relationship to other people and being moved by that uh, proper emotion to act. So which is truer? The God of the texts or the God of the traditions? 
I, I'm not going to settle that here. I, which is truer? I have no idea. Um, God may be completely uh, and utterly um, transcendent. <clears throat> uh, just a minute, I got to get my clock going here. So I, oh, my phone died. Um, and um, God may be completely and utterly transcendent. No human categories may apply to God at all. They may all be literally untrue of the divine nature. So I, I have no idea. I just want to say this, that it's hard for human beings to love like God if God is the holy other or the ground of being or actus purus. And I just want to say this about each of those things. I have no idea. In fact, I think we can have no idea what it means for God to be the holy other or the ground of being or actus purus. Um, it's uh, those categories so utterly transform, tra uh, so utterly transcend human abilities to grasp that I just, I don't know what they mean even. So how, how can we love like a being we don't understand or a being that is totally different from ourselves? Um, I just, I don't see how we could love like that, love like God. But we do know what it means to be a good father, a good shepherd, or uh, even, I think, roughly a mother hen. So what love looks, and we know roughly, I think, what love looks like for fathers, shepherds, and mother hens towards their children, flock, or chicks. And I, I pick three really different examples because I think, uh, I don't know if I'll have time to talk about it here. I did put something in the my abstract that I might talk about. Uh, I think a lot of, um, I, so I think if empathy is and compassion are, uh, affective states that are important to have with respect to other human beings in various cir circumstances, and then we act uh, on the basis of that. But we're to have different affective states for different people in different roles in life or different stations in life. Um, so uh, I think we're supposed to have a certain affective um, relationship with our, uh, our father, but uh, I think by extension, human beings should have certain affective relations with uh, elder males, for example, but they're not the same ones that you have with fathers. Um, we're to have certain affective relations with brothers, like li literal biological brothers, um, and we're to have ones like that for um, men and women who are spiritual brothers and sisters, but not the same, it's not the same affective relationship that we're supposed to have. I think love is way more complicated, for example, than thinking that there are four kinds of love in the New Testament. I think there are lots of loves uh, and they depend uh, on what's, um, what's proper for people in relationships, what's proper with respect to affective attitudes that we're supposed to have towards different people in the many, many, many different roles and relationships that we have with people. So um, if we're supposed to love like God, I think the God of the text is more informative and more inspirational than the God of the traditions. I don't think, I don't say it's more informative about the nature of God, because I, um, I don't claim to know here, but I think it's more informative as we try to understand the nature of human, human love if we love like the God of the text, then if we love, try to love like the God of the traditions. And again, I think it's more inspirational. Um, I think part of, of love writing is to move us to act in certain ways, not just to move us to think. Um, and so I think it inspires us to act in ways that we should act. So I, I suggest as we try to understand um, uh, biblical love, that we focus more on um, the God of the text than the God of the traditions. And that's what I'm gonna do as we move on here. Um, we probably all know roughly um, 
well, I assume people here in the Christian tradition know roughly um, love in the New Testament. I put love in scare quotes because I mean the word love or the words for love uh, in the New Testament. And I created a word, word cloud. I did it for a reason uh, in the word cloud. I'll come back to the word cloud in just a little bit. Um, but the but one word that's typically translated love in the, in, from the Greek to the New Testament is philea, brotherly love. And um, it's not just uh, biological brother love, although it includes that. It also includes close friend love. And uh, as such, it includes affection or liking. So um, brothers, and includes things like brothers, friendship, and spiritual brothers. Um, I have a lot to say about what it means to be a friend under these terms, but I, I'm going to skip it here. I'm just going to give the basic ideas. Uh, storge, I think, is a less known term to, uh, for Christians, but it's family affection or love. It occurs a few times in the Bible, and it involves the natural affective bonds found among biological family members. Um, Agape, which uh, is pure, willful, sacrificial love that intentionally desires another's highest good, and it's not dependent on the responses or attributes of the beloved. So as such, agape is unconditional, and people tend to take agape as the term for the highest form of love um, and um, as the most representative of God's love for other human beings. I think they do that because, in part, they think um, uh, agape doesn't require anything on the part of the loved, the, the one that's loved. Uh, it's unconditional. Uh, but also, people tend to um, think that agape does not include any, any kind of uh, affection. It's just pure, willful, sacrificial love that desires another's good. So it's like what I call benevolence. Um, um, I think I'll just stop there with that one. And finally, eros is actually never, the term eros, the word eros is never found in the New Testament. Um, so, and it's, um, I think in our day and age, people tend to associate eros with the erotic, with sensual or sexual love. Uh, but in the Greek culture, uh, in which the early church found itself, it also included emotional or desiring love, or romantic being in love, or the best of husband-wife love. Um, and uh, in almost all those cases, it's in the Hebrew scriptures, it's thought to be good, uh, except for sexual love outside of uh, marriage, that's thought to be bad. Um, and most of the time in the New Testament, we don't find it by name, but we find it by, um, I guess, use, um, where um, sexual indiscretions are uh, routinely um, uh, criticized. That's how it's found, even though the term eros isn't used. And this is one thing I found out here, and this is why I use the word cloud. In the New Testament, love is a jumble. Um, there's a passage, for example, where it says, Demas, in love with the present world, left, uh, and he, he leaves St. Paul, and the point is, it looks like he leaves Christianity. Demas, in love with the um, world, uh, has, left, oh, has left us for Thessalonica, is the way the verse goes. And you would think that Demas in love with the present world, it would be eros. It would be some sort of emotional or desiring love. There are things in the world that he wants more like fame or fortune or honor or, I don't know, more sleep uh, or less persecution or something like that. You would think that the word would be eros, but in fact, the word is agape or a form of agape, Demas in love with the world. And it's not, it doesn't look like what's going on there is pure willful sacrifice that intentionally desires another's highest good. 
And again, I think um, throughout the New Testament, the different terms, philea, storge, and agape, I think they're used um, interchangeably. So doing this sort of, um, uh, dividing up the terms in this way and thinking like, now I've got it. And I know what the highest form of love is. It doesn't involve any affection or emotion. It just involves pure, willful, sacrificial love. Um, I think that that misleads us in understanding um, what the what the terms mean, and um, and love is a jumble. And what we have to see is how the terms are used here. Um, I think this is a great example of uh, meaning is use, not coming up with some dictionary definition and or, or etymology and thinking that you've got exactly what the word means. You need to see how it's used in various contexts. Um, that said, I'm not going to. To do that here, I do it in the chapter in the book. I'm just going to look at a couple of times to see how it's used. And probably everyone knows this, um, that love in the Christian tradition. Just, I'm going to get my wife's clock so I know what time it is. My, my phone died. I'll be right back. Got it. Okay. Um, so this passage, I think, is the most famous passage on love in the New Testament. An expert in religious law asked him, Jesus, a question to test him. Teacher, which commandment in the law is the greatest? Jesus said to him, love your heart with all your uh, love God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. This is the second and greatest commandment. The second is like unto it. Love your neighbor as yourself. All the law and all the prophets depend on these two commandments. There's a lot to be said here, but I want to look at, at, at what I think um, neighbor typically means to us and what we've learned from, I think, from cognitive psychology and evolutionary psychology is that for most of us, neighbor is us. Um, and um, neighbor involves some sort of reciprocity that we um, we have relations of mutual benefit with lots of other human beings. Uh, Jesus was a Hebrew. He went to a uh, synagogue. He lived in a neighborhood of uh, other Hebrews. Uh, they probably looked something alike. Um, and in a sense, neighbor meant person we can trust. and. And there, there probably are people that have earned our trust. You have to show that. Um, there have to be ways to signal that we're neighbors. We, uh, and there have to be ways that we can mutually benefit neighbors. If, if people don't mutually benefit us, we're inclined not to be neighbor to them. And um, non-neighbor most of the time meant them. There's an us and them, and that often meant enemy. Uh, the Romans, the non-Jews, and and we have them um, in our own cultures. Uh, I I had a, a I have a friend who's a seminary teacher, and he asked all of his students, uh, and this is at a Dutch Christian Reformed Seminary in Grand Rapids, Michigan. He asked all of his students to keep a list for a week of everybody that they had contact with. And then they had to say, like, what kind of contact you had with them. And almost all of them um, had, they went to church twice on Sundays, so they had contact with Christians there. They, and not just Christians, but Christians like them. And, and their kids went to Christian schools. So they went to schools with kids who were like them. And then they would go to activities at the, after school, and they would be with people that were like them. And they would take their automobile to a mechanic that was a Christian. And, uh, you know, you want a mechanic you can trust. And um, they might go grocery shopping, but not talk to anybody. In short, they would have, they had a whole week's list of people that they, um, that they came in contact with. And it was always someone like them that looked and acted like them, that believed like them. They never ran into, for example, a, 
a black person or a Muslim. They never had a conversation. It makes it really hard to get out of uh, the sort of tribalism that we face. And non-neighbors, even though they in principle thought they should be kind to them, they had no re no um, relationships with them whatsoever. Th this is the sort of background and cognitive and evolutionary psychology of, of neighbors and um, non-neighbors. But in the New Testament, love of neighbor, uh, a love of non-neighbor, sorry, extends even to loving one's enemy, or as we find out that enemy should be uh, um, someone that we uh, bring into the, do the domain of neighbor. So it extends to love of enemy. You have heard it said, you shall love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I say to you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you. And I, I think this all fits within um, the concept of God's kingdom and the promise of God's kingdom, which in the New Testament says has come and is coming. And uh, God's kingdom is a, is a kingdom of inclusive peace, of shalom and flourishing. And, and who is it for? Well, restricting love to kin and neighbor with thwart God's promise to Abraham to, through his defendants, descendants, bless all people, not just us, but them, not just neighbors, but enemies, that all people are to be blessed. Um, um, and that, and um, I think the Hebrews were supposed to understand that they were the ones to take that blessing to all the people. And likewise, Jesus demonstrates inclusive love. He invites in the poor, the widow, the orphan, the prisoner, the child, the leper, the outsider, the oppressed, and even the enemy. Um, so only when kingdom love opens one's heart to the enemy, and this is, again, to have the right affective desires, only then is compassion extended as God promised Abraham to all flesh. So I think love... Uh, it's subservient in some sense to the to God's kingdom uh, of peace. So I think in the Bible there are, I, I think if you could summarize it, there are two loves. One is acting to promote the benefit and well-being of other human beings. This is clearly in there. It's in the Bible. And, um, and I think it needs to be in there. Uh, and by the way, many people who write on this topic reduce Christian love to benevolence. They think agape is just acting to promote the well-being of other human beings. Doesn't matter how you feel. It doesn't matter what your effective attitudes are towards other human beings. And I think benevolence is important, but I think it's always second best uh, in the, in the uh, when you look at the whole thrust of the New Testament, where empathy eludes us, where we find another person unlovable or disgusting or fearsome. Benevolence is our fallback, second best love. Love insists, uh, it ne but it never gives a pass. You, you can never not be loving. So even if, you, even if you don't have the right effective attitudes towards someone, you still have to act in love. But the highest form of love in the Bible, and I don't have any other name for it than to just capitalize love, and this is acting out of empathy and compassion to meet the needs of others. Um, so these are all the terms that are all, a lot of the different terms that people take to, um, to be characteristic of biblical love. I think biblical love in its highest form is a mixture of affection, friendship, eros, and charity and agape. Uh, uh, you can add storge to it. You can add like all of them. I think it's all a jumble. And then we have to figure out, well, what's the proper uh, affections, what's the right sort of empathy, what's the right sort of relationship, depending on person and role and relationship. And I think loving, we're supposed to love God with all of our heart, soul, mind, and strength. And we're supposed to love our neighbor as ourselves. If we're to love, you know, like we love God, that requires us bringing our thoughts, feelings, and desires into uh, what moves us to love other people. And we're to cultivate that for people that we find initially unlovable or disgusting or fearsome. Um, this is to be cultivated for human beings um, to bring up about the kingdom of peace. So summing up, the Bible teaches the insistence of love to act for the good of friends, 
the needy women, children, the outcasts, the poor, the sick, the suffering, the sinner, and the stranger. The Bible tells us what kind of person a lover is. It's it's empathetic, self-sacrificial, kind, patient, and forgiving. The Bible connects loving acts and loving persons to a loving God. God is the ground of love, the empowerer of love. uh, it may be that, that uh, empathy, for example, and compassion come to us as gifts from God. Um, God is the exempl- exemplar of love and the transformer of persons into lovers. Uh, and by the exemplar of love, again, I think the God of the text is vastly more informative and inspiring than the God of the traditions. And I think love aims at peace and, um, and it's peace not just peace with God so that you get into heaven and know that your eternal state is going to be good, um, that you will no longer, you will no longer be an enemy of God. It aims at peace in this life. um, And that is um, peace with, uh, with radical, radically inclusive love and justice here on earth. um, Love that extends from family to neighbor to distant neighbor, even to enemy. So I'm going to, this will be my last, my concluding statements. Uh, I think, I think love is often used to divide that there's a kind of apologetic use of love in the Christian tradition. Uh, And so that love, um, love becomes a bat with which Christians beat uh, people who are in other religions, especially Jews and Muslims. And I put this picture up here to uh, incite a stereotype that people have of Muslims. And I wanna show this stereotype in some comments in a little bit. So I think the view is this, Christianity is a religion of love and not a religion like the religion of love that uh, our awesome God is the best lover and that every other religion is defective. And so, and then, so this is the myth Christianity is a religion of love, which I think is true. Christianity is a religion of love, but, and then this is the myth, Judaism is tribal, that God's love is restricted only to a certain tribe, um, and that Islam is a religion of justice. It's not a religion of love, and I I put in here, I, I won't tell you who this is, but I found these quotations on a Facebook page of a famous Christian philosopher who I think is an unbelievably bigoted Islamophobe. And, um, and he perpetuates these myths on his Facebook page. And every once in a while, I go on his Facebook page and try to argue with him and with, uh, with his friends, but it doesn't seem to do any good. Uh, so all of these quotes were on this page of a friend of mine, famous Christian philosopher, Uh, These quotes are not by him, but he encourages these quotations. Uh, So this is one. There is no love in Islam. The Islamic way of life is filled with hate, harshness, and rigidity. A Muslim cannot be a U.S. citizen because there is no love in Islam, but everything opposite of love. Islam is based on illicit power, sadistic control, harshness, death, subjugation, dominance, slavery, exploitation, bondage. Well, you get the point. But love is the foundation of this universe, and God is love. Again, a religion that claims to be from God must take love at, at its, as its hallmark. Devoted Muslims have their minds and emotions taken away. This is why they strap explosives on their children. Knowing Jesus Christ is the only key to true love, there is no love in Islam. Um, I think, I'll think, I'm just going to say two quick things here. Um, Christians don't want to be judged by the KKK, uh, and Muslims that I know don't want to be judged by ISIS. Uh, It's just not fair to be judged by the worst of us uh, or the worst in our religion, or I think people that aren't part of our religion. I think it's just totally unfair. And if we're completely honest, um, there is no more ardent exporter of violence around the world than the United States. Um, uh, you know, God bless America, but um, we drop a lot of bombs on a lot of innocent people, uh, and we we shouldn't excuse ourselves. 
um, based on thinking that we're God's chosen. So these are the love wars. And uh, in my book, I try to show that uh, that Judaism properly understood and Islam properly understood um, are religions of love. And um, the passage that I read from Jesus about loving your neighbor as yourself, um, we find here in the, almost verbatim in the Hebrew uh, Bible in Leviticus 19. And I, I, I think I'll read this and then quickly move to the Islamic thing. When you reap the harvest of your land, you shall not reap your field right up to the edge, neither shall you gather the gleanings after your harvest, and you shall not strip your vineyard, vineyard bare, neither shall you gather the fallen grapes of your vineyard. You shall leave them for the poor and for the sojourner. I am the Lord your God. Uh, it goes on and says um, what you should do, and then it gets to the end. You shall not hate your brother in the heart, but you shall reason frankly with your neighbor, lest you incur sin because of him. You shall not take vengeance or bear a grudge against the sons of your own people, but you shall love your neighbor as yourself. I am the Lord. And, and if you look at the above passage, I think you can see um, that he tells us to love our neighbor as ourselves, but then he tells us what this love is. Um, it's leaving food for the hungry. It's being uh, just to the, to the, um, uh, to the poor, it's being kind to the blind, uh, it's being good to the deaf. People that were oppressed and outcasts, it tells us what love is. And um, so I think we find that almost verbatim in the Hebrew Bible, and that's not the only place. And in the Islamic tradition, we find um, uh, in uh, Hadith, uh, almost similar message, None of you has faith until he loves the person what he loves for himself and, and until he loves a person only for the sake of Allah, the exalted. Uh, and I think I'll read the last one to give you some content of what love is in the Quran. Be good to parents and to kinsmen and orphans and the needy and the close neighbor and the distant neighbor and the companion at your side and the wayfarer. Surely Allah does not like the proud and the boastful. I think we find... Uh, almost identical teachings, um, making, you know, giving allowance for uh, language and social situation. I think we find almost a, um, um, similar teachings uh, about love in each of the three traditions. Um, there is no winner of the love war. Okay, I think my time is up here. I'll stop and and turn it back to any discussions you might have. Thank you very much, Professor Kelly Cork. Um, I just want to express again my gratitude for you to be here um, to uh, delivering this talk. I also want to ask everyone who has questions um, to leave either in the chat or uh, step ahead and ask your questions. Um, Again, if there is no, not enough time to ask um, every question here, to respond to every question here, um, I will send uh, the remaining questions to Professor Kelly Clark to respond later if he wants uh, via email, okay? So let's begin with Professor Ricardo Silvestre and then uh, the remaining ones after him, okay? Go ahead, Professor Ricardo. Thank you very much, Assis. Thank you very much, Claire. Uh, Claire uh, 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 Kelly, it was a very, very wonderful talk and just such amazing topic. Very, very, very interesting. So I, I, I have two questions, if you allow me. Uh, and the, the, the first one, I mean, I don't know if, if, if you want to, to deal with that, but I was wondering about what kind of thing love is. Uh, and of course, you, you spoke about what I would say two, two different things, but related, of course. I mean, in some sense, I would translate like that. Love as a state of mind, or as, 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 a, as a kind of experience that we have, a kind of feeling, and you, you correct me if I'm wrong. And on the other side, a kind of a behavioristic approach. I mean, you act, you have to act upon uh, what you call love. So I was wondering if I'm right uh, about the relations that that might exist between those two things. If if you if 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 you you have this mental state 
is like is it, it's like you you have to act in in, in a specific way it is like a an interesting consequence of having this kind of laws or they are somehow separated so that that's the first question yeah and, and, and the second question may I, okay you, you wanna you, you want to answer the, the, the first question is not really so i'm hoping that second question is easier <laughs> okay i don't know uh, I have to take advantage of your idea. Uh, the second one is about uh, what you might call the object of laws, because you, you speak about, I mean, in the, the, the two commandments, they are, I think, pretty clear about that. In, in one of them, the object of law is God himself, and, and in the other one, the object of law is human beings in general, say. So, so I was wondering, and I was wondering first, uh, about the relationship between those two things. I mean, if, if, if there's some ontological hierarchy, in the sense that if you love God, really, if you truly love God, automatically you will love uh, uh, human beings or other human beings, or, or not. And, and other, I was wondering about non-human beings, animals. If, if I don't, that, that's, I, that's not, I think, part of, of, of Christian Christian tradition, but I was wondering if this love can also be extended to non-human beings. That's it. Yeah. So um, just a couple quick things to your second question. Um, I, I think that um, I think that the the tradition thinks that you can't love other you can't really love other human beings unless unless you love God first. And um, it doesn't say that explicitly, and near as I can tell, in in the, the New Testament. And I think it would be silly to to um, to think that. And there probably was a time when I would have thought that, but now I think, well, look, parents love their children, um, and uh, atheist parents can love their children. They don't have to love God first. There's not. Um, they can wake up in the middle of the night and hear their child crying and uh, be moved by their suffering and go in and relieve it. So um, I think it's uh, harder to think of um, uh, of enemy love. I think it's harder to think of, even with neighbor love, I think it happens sometimes, um, but I think it, it, it's difficult for us to understand how deep a lot of our neighbor love is uh, mutual benefit. And here's one way to tell if it's mutual benefit. If, if your neighbor stops benefiting you somehow, um, how easy it is to turn off that friendship. Um, uh, we, shed, we can shed friends and we can shed neighbors pretty easily if uh, the, the mutual benefits relationship stops. So, uh, so I think it's easy to overestimate how loving we are. Um, and, um, and, and then you might think, well, uh, without divine assistance, it gets really hard, um, not, to, not merely to love in the mode of mutual benefit. Um, so uh, anyway, the tradition will come to think that you can't love anybody without loving God first, that it all has to sort of go through God. And, and in fact, Augustine doesn't think you even love anybody or should love any human being. And I think he thinks you can't really love any human being except in, in the mode of eros, uh, unless your love goes through God first, that it has to go through God and be, um, it becomes godlike, your love becomes godlike, but then it's just benevolence. It's not, there's no more eros, there's no more feeling. All the feeling is um, dropped. You love them the way God loves them and God loves in the mode of benevolence. So I think the tradition will come to see it that way. Uh, and I think you can see why the tradition might think it's that way. But I, to me, it just um, undermines the sort of natural affection human beings have for other human beings and other circumstances. Um, and probably mainly um, in romantic relations and parent-child relations and child-parent relations. Um, your first one, I don't have a big grand answer to 
uh, what what love is, other than what I what I said. Um, it's um, yeah. I think I'll just stop there. There's a lot of questions, and I think I I, I don't have anything illuminating to say, Ricardo. So so I won't. Thank you again, Professor Kelly. Uh, now, please, Ali, with your question. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Professor Clark, uh, for your nice presentation. My question is about the nature of the relationship between Satan and God. Uh, could you uh, please elaborate on this? Uh, the, the point is that in Islamic tradition and some other traditions, it seems that the original relationship between Satan and God was uh, in, uh, in nature a kind of love from the part of Satan towards the God. And uh, when God created the human beings and then uh, some sort of jealousy set in and uh, the relation got soared and uh, became a hate. So could you please elaborate on this point, whether you consider the original relation between Satan and God as a form of uh, very high level love? Um, so, well, insofar as I believe in Satan, uh, which is maybe one out of seven days, uh, I view the original relationship as one of love, but I have no, I, I, I just think it's a complete mystery, uh, in the way that we think it's the way Christians have to think it's a mystery, like why Adam and Eve sinned if they were in paradise. It's like, well, Satan was in like more paradise or <laughs> paradise or, or something like that. It was all it was all better and more love and more direct. And uh, and how could that possibly happen? But I but I do think that um, that our tradition thinks that um, Satan was in a relationship with of love with God. And then but then but then and then you tell a story about how it, they sort of fell out of love. But it's got to be like an impossible story uh, about how they fell out of love, because in this state of perfection, you wonder what what like Satan became jealous of God. You know what? Like how? How does this happen? Uh, well, you... excuse me. May I, may I make a correction? Uh, I didn't mean that uh, Satan became jealous of God. Satan became jealous of human beings because uh, his uh, beloved one, the God, actually uh, uh, put attention to human beings, like a man who is beloved by, by a woman, but he pays attention to another woman. So a yeah. kind of jealousy happens between yeah. two. Man, I'm trying to write this down. Because we don't have the same stories in the Christian tradition. Um, and there's no there's no story of the fall of Satan in, in any, that I'm aware of in any biblical writ. So people write about it later. Um, and it's only in the tradition that, unless somebody can correct me here, I, I just don't know, but Satan falls before Adam and Eve are created. Um, and uh, he didn't have, and in the Christian traditional narrative, uh, you have the fall of Satan and the creation of earth, and then, uh, then Satan tempts Adam and Eve. So it's a different story. So another narrative is uh, concerning the Mesopotamian uh, mythical figure Lilith, uh, which actually uh, is in, it seems to be in a love competition with Eve for the love of Adam. So uh, how do you, uh, do you think about this story? It seems that the, there is a competition between Eve and Lilith for the love of uh, yeah. Adam. Yeah. So this is also a, another variant of this. Yeah, well, I, honestly, I don't know, Ali. It's been part of what's been really interesting to me is I, I you know, the first book that I wrote um, with Muslims uh, was called Abraham's Children. And I just assumed that we all had exactly the same narratives of everything. And I didn't know it was just total ignorance. And it's been um, uh, a big learning curve for me to try to uh, understand how, uh, how, we have different narratives and um, and sometimes they're really different and then try to figure out their relationship, what's being said and the like. So, um, and I let tradition speak for themselves. Like I try to, um, I try not to speak for Muslims. So the book I'm writing on, on love, 
I call it an autobiography of love. I, I say what I learned, what I've learned from Muslims, not what Muslims believe uh, or what Muslims say about this or that. So, and it, it, again, it's a long way of saying, I don't know that story exactly. And I haven't thought about it very much. So, um, but I do think we have to be wary of thinking that, uh, of thinking of Islam in terms of our, of like Christian tropes. Like I, I thought the, I thought the mosque was the Christian version of the church. And so in America, you join a church. And so I just assumed everybody joined their local mosque. And uh, in America, you go to your church every Sunday morning, sometimes on Sunday evening, sometimes on Wednesday night. Your church is the focus of your religious practices. And, and I learned mosques don't play that same role uh, in, uh, in Islam. Anyway, it's just a simple way of saying it's easy. There's a lot of people in the audience who are Christians, and it's easy for us to try to think of other religions in the ways we think of our own. And we're sort of, we sort of colonize religions that way. It's understandable. This is how we, uh, our, our spiritual geography divides things up differently. But we think this is how everyone divides them up. And uh, anyway, to me, there's been a lot of really cool lessons to learn working with people from another tradition. And, and, and honestly, Ali, I hope we have some uh, chances for our paths to cross soon, besides here. Sure. Thank you again, guys. Uh, I love hearing, uh, listening to your engagement on, about this issue. Um, Perhaps something that can be also illuminating. Uh, I was wondering about what Professor Kelly Clark said about how it is hard to understand um, how people like Adam and Eve or even Satan could um, end up in morally reproved um, actions like sin, you know, even though they have been in a state of paradise, for example. And uh, it reminds me of something, some uh, metaphysical concepts like turns toward depravity um, from Alvin Plantinga, for example. You know, uh, Professor Kelly, perhaps, do you see any connections with turns toward depravity, for example? It looks like it's it could be a way that God created the world, like um, in which there is a possibility of evil in the world, you know? So perhaps you have something to talk about this that could be illuminating in this way? Yeah. Uh, well, to be clear, trans world depravity, Planica thinks not only is not true, he thinks it's not even plausible. So, uh, so I think it's not true myself, and I think it's not plausible. Uh, that said, I think creating people with free will um, uh, is risky business, and I think that's plausible, and it creates opportunities for failures of love. And I think... Um, and I think a characteristic expression of the sort of uh, trans world depravities that we, the sort of depravities that we have, I guess, free will journey depravities is the us them distinction is huge in people and it creates fears. And fear is way more powerful than love. Um, and I think uh, evolutionarily, we have uh, a really good story to tell of how um, how our various fears have kept us tribal and made it hard to love people who are different from us at all. But I, I, you know, the first chapter of my book on love is called Fear and the Failures of Love. Um, and, um, and this is something that I, I start to look for then in uh, these various texts. There's some really good questions in the comments. So uh, in the chat. Yeah, I want you to... Go ahead with um, following the order in the in the chat. So, um, so there's a really interesting question from Tatiana uh, Barbov Barkovsky. Uh, she said the my recent research concerns feminine images of God within the Christian Christian tradition as presented in medieval theology. Um, which I would like to ask the following question: Have you found any difference between the love felt and expressed by masculine and feminine God? Mm. Um, 
the later illustrated, for example, by the mother, the metaphor which you evoked in your presentation then? Yeah, so I have a, I have a section on uh, feminine images of the divine in my chapter on Christian love. And uh, I, I think that um, I think that we should think that the the Hebrew Bible and the New Testament are written at a time um, when you had uh, distant kings who reign on high and they will good things for their subjects. Uh, they don't leave their glorious castle. They don't enter into the glorious, uh, sorry, the dirty and gritty lives of their um, of their um, peasants and they exist in a state of eternal perpetual bliss. Um, they don't have many needs. They're sort of uh, apathetic really. Uh, and, and yet there are a few uh, feminine images of the divine. And no, I don't just mean the mother hen. I did that for a reason, but there are mothers and mother love in one or two passages are, um, ex are offered as examples of divine love. So, uh, and I write about, uh, and I think they're important, and I think we should see um, that they're typically ignored in favor of um, male and masculine masculine images of the divine. And then we miss out on what I think are stereotypically um, better ways that we should respond to human beings. Women are stereotypically, and honestly, actually not so stereotypically, um, more emotional. And I don't mean that in a negative sense. Uh, if you... Uh, if you put people on an autism spectrum, women are more in touch with uh, with other people's thoughts, feelings, and desires than men are as a group of people. Um, and my whole point is we're supposed to be more in touch with people's thoughts, feelings, and desires and responsive to them um, and uh, in ways that uh, that move us to acts of love. So uh, I think it's time to recover I can't see Tatiana here. I'd like to see her. Anyway, I, could you send me what you've written, Tatiana? I'd love to see it um, and see if I can improve my section on uh, feminine images of the divine. I think there are some uh, there are some in the Hebrew Bible and the New Testament, and they're important. And it's important for us to contextualize the more dominant um, male father king images of the divine, which are stereotypically fathers are more stoic um, and um, kings are more distant and um, the virtue of love for a king would be benevolence. Um, the father sort of stoically enduring what happens and still courageously doing what's right. Um, those are all stereotypes and they're ones that need to be countered with um, I, I, I myself am not that uh, conservative, so I don't think you have to have a, uh, you know, a Bible verse for everything you, you say, but, uh, but if you are, there are resources in the New Testament for, I think, uh, more feminine views of love, more stereotypically feminine views of love. Okay, thank you. So uh, please, Joseph, go ahead and ask your question. Yes, hi. Uh, there's something that I've been wondering for many years, which is, is there real love? Meaning all love seems to be conditional because it's almost impossible to love unconditionally. Let's say I have a friend, a very close friend. But if I find out that the friend does me real harm, I will perhaps not hate him, but the love will dissipate. It will certainly cease to exist. The same with God. God wants me to follow his commands. So God is not loving me. He loves the contingency. He loves the fact that I do this command. So we seem to be love. We seem to be loving a certain part of me or a certain behavior that comes out of me or whatever it is. But it's not. It's not a real love that stays forever. It's it 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 seems to be not real. Yeah. I didn't see who said who is who is that. Who is what? Who 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 just asked that question? I I couldn't see. Oh, my name is Joseph Frank. Oh, you're Joseph. Okay. Uh, well, I'm probably like you, Joseph. I'm a I'm a kind of a love skeptic myself. Uh, 
I, it's not that I think we don't see it. Um, it's that most of the time what we see is reciprocity. Um, we see conditional, uh, various forms of conditional love. Um, so I think this is, I think what I've written is a pretty high ideal. I think the biblical forms of love are in all three of the traditions are pretty high ideals. Um, you know, I, I think we're supposed to give money to beggars, but but I never give a dime to a beggar because I think they're all alcoholics and I don't love them unconditionally, um, if I'm honest. Yeah, so, so I don't think we see it very much in the world. And I think even if we did see what we wasn't, was an appearance of it, if we could dig, dig down into people's psyches a little deeper, um, we'd find that it was way more complex than what we thought. Um, so, uh, you know, it's like the, uh, I, I don't know if you know what cost, costly signaling theory is. And um, we want people to think that we're virtuous. And sometimes it, it, um, it's costly. Most of the time it's costly in, uh, in cognitive psychology, it's costly and not very frequent, uh, or it's not very costly and frequent, but we want people to think that we're virtuous. And we do it in in various ways. And one might be that we, uh, well, I had a student one time that was taught, um, they divided, I taught at a Christian college for a while and they divided all the students up and they went and worked in the inner city. And one student came to class and said all the great things they did to my whole class. And then said, uh, and we had the, we had the best group. And all of a sudden there's like this pride that comes up and then probably there's this pride because it's really hard for rich people to actually be kind to poor people and not look down on them. Uh, kindness can be a kind of glittering vice. Uh, as Nietzsche said, charity is really hard to do uh, for people because, um, because we we can hardly do it sometimes without holding our nose and looking down on people that we were sharing with. So, Joseph, I I'm kind of a love skeptic. Um, and what does it get? As, and how do you view it in terms of God? Um, yeah, I hadn't I hadn't thought about that so much, and. Um, and because it's a the, good the, question, the, Joseph. I think I'll just pass on it. Let people think about it, because um, yeah, I just haven't thought that much about it. Okay, thank you so much. Yeah, yeah. I was wondering though um, if we can describe like parental love. In, I mean, I agree with you, Kelly, that it's hard to see um, from time to time the kind of unconditional love. Yeah. So that even the absence of, of ability to see that love might um, wonder, um, make us skeptical about uh, the possibility of love at all. But parental love seems to be a good representation of this kind of love, right? I don't know if there is any kind of evolutionary explanation for that, for this or not, but it, it seems to be visible uh, to be visible even in animals. So, you know, um, yeah. The mother right, right. always seems to work to protect their uh, children, you know, if, even humans or animals, you know. Yeah. Can I chime in? Can I chime into that question? Yeah, sure. Go ahead, please. Okay, this is something I've been wondering a lot. Imagine you go home with a baby, you love the baby for a year, and after an investigation of a year, they find out that it's not your baby, it was exchanged in the hospital, and they bring another baby. What happens to that love, that fatherly love? Yeah, good point. Yeah, thank you. Have anything to say, Professor Kelly? Yeah. Uh, well, I think um, I think that um, lots of times fathers. I, this is an empirical question, and we're philosophers, so uh, so I, I think lots of times um, the uh, the couple bonds with the baby. Uh, even if it's not theirs, there's no doubt that um, uh, there's an unbelievably deep bond that parents have for their children. Um, and it's the closest, I think, uh, human 
So some people probably aren't married here and won't get this, but anyone who is married and has small kids will know uh, the, the most I've learned about unconditional love has been raising children. And, and I wonder how I would have learned it otherwise um, because it's so insistent and it's so often, especially when your kids are young, but uh, even when they get older, you still, uh, my youngest is 28 years old and I, uh, I had a talk with him the other day and, uh, you know, he's not living up to expectations and, and it's hard to watch, it's, but you still like, you never stop worrying about him. Uh, at any rate, I wonder how I would have ever learned about uh, unconditional love without having kids wake me up in the middle of the night when I'm exhausted, and have other things I want to do. Um, so, uh, my own kids don't so far don't seem to want to have children. And I think, well, uh, then you're never going to learn this, <laughs> but uh, also I think this, um, you're not going to have anybody do to you what you did to me. Uh, you know, I, I want them to have that experience, uh, to be more sympathetic with their parents. Anyway, I, I think sometimes people do bond after a year, uh, with people who aren't their biological children, but we have pretty powerful built-in biological mechanisms for um, making sure that uh, that we don't waste time uh, raising other people's children because, uh, and not just humans, but animals, all sorts of animals have ways of, of uh, ensuring that the offspring they care for are actually their offspring. Um, so we're pretty we're pretty biologically hardwired to um, love our own biological kin. Thank you. Um, I want to go ahead with the next question in the chat. Um, Veronica is asking. Uh, first, first of all, she's uh, saying thank you for your talk. Uh, she said. She says. Don't you think that the Gospels insist the idea that we shouldn't love only our neighbors, but also our enemies, whereas the Jewish and Muslim sacred text, texts uh, that you've quoted insist on the idea that we should love our neighbors only? It seems that that's the question. Yeah. So she looks. It looks like she's making a differentiation between those uh, those three um, traditions. You know. Yeah. So go ahead. Yeah, it's hard. Uh the the terms that are used so you have i i don't recall a place in the quran for example where it says love your enemy but it does tell people to love their near neighbors and their distant neighbors and um and i take it the distant neighbors are people that aren't in your tribe and that's how i'm taking um the the enemy part uh, not just to be um enemy but to be not us anybody that's not us is them and them as an enemy so i think you find without the exact same terms or semantic equivalent i think you find something that's close to a semantic equivalent in the um in the quran uh, i i haven't finished the chapter on uh judaism yet so i'm um I'm not sure what it says exactly about enemies, except that I think that uh, God's promise to Abraham is that there it, it, is that the um, he wants to give blessing to all people, and so that would include people they identify as enemies. That that's as far as I've gotten with uh, Judaism. Thank you. Uh, that's the that's my turn to ask the question. So I've been wondering uh, whether. Uh, actually, some skeptics um, seem to express this skepticism based on some inconsistencies between uh, God's attributes, several attributes, for example, love, mainly love and justice, for example. Um, some people might say, I mean, it would be unjust for God to leave, for example, people like Adolf Hitler uh, get unpunished in eternity. People, Other people might say that it would be um an expression of the absence of love in the part of God if he punished people yeah. uh, in hell, sends people for hell, for example. So is there any possibility of punishment um, when it comes to um, 
a, be- a, a divine being who has love as one of um, its attri- uh, his attributes. So how can he be able to punish punish someone? You know. So yeah, that's my question. Yeah. Uh, well, there are lots of reasons to punish people. Um, one reason to punish is just to get them away from other people to keep them from harming other people. So, so, and I don't think that's unloving. Uh, and um, so some people think it's just loving. It's not, it's not only just, but it's loving for you to treat human beings as um, uh, the, the way to treat human beings with respect who've done something like illegal is to give them what they are due and what they're due is punishment. And um, I think that's roughly C.S. Lewis's view. Uh, but it, and, and then there, here's a third view. You might think that, um, that um, if you're loving, that punishment is primarily for rehabilitation. So the, the second case would be retribution. And you might think it's okay uh, for a loving being to do that because you're treating the person who's the wrongdoer uh, with with respect, with equality and respect, uh, you're giving them what they're due as uh, a, as a human being, and what they're due is punishment. Um, and then the last would be rehab- rehabilitation, which we in the United States don't do enough of in our prisons. When we when we punish people, uh, I I don't think it's even we have really excessive punishments here. Uh, compared to Europe, for example, our punishments are really excessive. And um, if you ha- if you commit three minor crimes, uh, a lot of states have what's called three strikes and you're out, and then y- you go to prison for the rest of your life. Well, a lot of young people commit crimes that they just sort of grow out of. Most people grow out of crime. And um, so to keep someone in prison for life for stealing candy bars three times, um, is excessive. So we don't have rehabilitation much here. We don't view prison as rehabilitative. And even if we think that that's our view, our prisons are so bad, almost no one has ever rehabilitated. It's really hard. We have a 80 some percent recidivism rate. Uh, and at any rate, all three of those could be justified, I think, under the uh, guys of love in various ways. We don't do it that way, but they, they could be. And as far as God goes, I'm not a big fan of eternal hell because I don't think that could be justified under any uh, any view of punishment. I just, I don't see how any, even Hitler merits an eternity of hell. Maybe he merits one for a long time. Um, but uh, but I don't see how in an eternal torture chamber, I just don't see how a loving God could do that, uh, even to someone like Hitler. And I, per, I prefer to think, I think that we should think of ourselves more like Hitler than like Jesus. And that we should hope that even Hitler, like people like me, are rehabilitated uh, uh, by God than um, hoping that we need to be like Jesus in order to um, to be loved by God for eternity. Thank you, Kelly. So uh, perhaps the next question will be from uh, Mahavi. Uh, can you go ahead and ask your question, please? Hi, good morning. Um, I have a, a, a couple of co- comments actually, and, and also a question related to those comments. Underlying these perceptions of love is a singular perception of what a rational individual would behave like. And that hasn't really been defined. I I mean, not everyone has the same thought processes. And arguably, we could say that there's some concept of nature versus nurture that determines the concept of rational thinking. And so that's a little that's a little challenging to me because I, I really think that these are in a way somewhat overly simplified perceptions. And the, the other part here, um, and I'm going to tie this back to a couple of comments that you've made, which is that uh, we are focused only on loving those, those elements that are genetically connected to us. So we prefer our own children to those of others. I believe that, that there is a tremendous um, example out there that that is not the case, even both in the human realm as well as in other animals. 
that there is a tremendous capacity to show love and compassion to something that is not your child. And the whole perception of thinking of it only as being it related to it being your child is more aligned with the idea that of an individualism focused society. Um, and that's that, that brings me to the other element here, which I think seems to be missing in the discussion, which is how economic characteristics, and I'm an economist, affect people's perceptions of their reality, their capacity for rational thinking, their capacity for love, and how that then translates in terms of the behavior of the child into its capacity for love. So first, there is a set of discussion items that seem to be based on an absolute rational standard agent that in reality more than likely doesn't exist. And then the rest of it, when we're talking about real people and their really day-to-day -day interactions, the innate component of us is being augmented based on economic conditions which affect directly the environment that we live in, which then affect our cognitive capabilities. So should we not also be discussing how the environment and the economic elements related to that affect the ability to feel love. A person who is poor and cannot feed their family is thinking about survival before they're thinking about compassionate love. And even if they believe in God, the poverty and the misery that they face leads to their questioning of God. So there is a different set of circumstances than the person who has a full belly. One could say the vulnerable are the most challenged to actually understand, articulate, and live with love. And, uh, and those that have more are less so, but perhaps less prone to provide love given that their, their needs are satiated. So uh, I, I guess my question, if I'm gonna put this in a question, is that what are the parameters that, that basically allow people to feel love? And don't they, I mean, aren't, isn't, aren't, isn't this whole conversation in many ways sort of determined based on those parameters? Because it just can't happen. The, the discussion can't just happen in a in a broad spectrum of realities. Yeah, uh, thanks. That's a good question. In my defense, I only had forty minutes, uh, Madavi, so uh, I couldn't say everything that needed to be said. But I do. So uh, I relativize uh, my understanding of love. I, I said before in our various roles and relationships, and and I should have added circumstances. Um, cause I think all of those, um, are so, so then there, are, and so I, so I'm not thinking that there's one sort of, um, uh, ideally rational agent that, um, feels empathy and then acts. Um, I think that there are an infinite, potentially infinite number of agents who have, vast numbers of roles and vast numbers of relationships, but also really vastly different circumstances. And um, those all generate really different, uh, I, I don't know what to even to call them exactly, but um, uh, uh, but, they're, but uh, with respect to the sorts of things you had, someone who's really poor and can't come up with enough food for their family, there are lots of people in that situation who are uh, who are prevented by their circumstances from acting the way they, they certainly want to act. So they have the right empathy, but they're not able to act. And to me, that's tragic and needs to be recognized. And then people who can act uh, in those circumstances should, you know, should seek. To me, that's a, a breach in the peace that, uh, that we're supposed to be creating in the world. There shouldn't be people who are put in that circumstance. And so to me, love is to get us to see that we need to create better circumstances for people in the world. So I, I don't mean to be very, you know, I don't mean to come off as so reductive. I think it's really super rich and complicated. And, uh, and then there are challenges here, not just for the poor person who can't um, feed their family, but also for people um, around the world who should be, I think, moved by love to um, generate better circumstances for people in those uh, situations. So may I just make one comment here? I mean, the, the, the issue that I'm dealing with in terms of my own work is specifically related to the value system. The secularization of values has actually impeded the ability 
one could say, to actually even allow for a homogeneity of this sense of, of familial uh, sentiment towards our neighbor. But in recognizing that and recognizing that we are in a relatively valueless society, it seems that, that the connection needs to be made between how can you secularize this concept of love in order to be able to create uh, the kind of society that embodies it. It, it, we, we are seeing a demise in, in religion across the board. So it, it does seem like a, the religion has to play a role in the secular. If, if it truly itself has love for its fellow brethren, it needs to be able to rise above its own, its own, uh, uh, its own shackles, its own institutions to reach the majority. Yeah, yeah I've heard a lot of, um, I work, I do a lot of work on the cognitive science of atheism and um, and so I've heard a lot of talks by atheists who think we can just get rid of the church but um, uh, and the church's influence on the West or religion's influence around the world but um, but replace it with and then they don't have an answer for um, what can ground uh, pro-social behavior I guess and one thing that can ground it is uh, you know, something you alluded to. Um, I think the Christian idea is that um, the other people's children become my children in some spiritual sense. And so I have some obligation and if they're starving, I should feel moved to relieve their starving. Uh, well, Christians aren't awesome at that, but they're, I don't know, they're pretty, they're, uh, they're better than they might be otherwise. Let's put it that way. You know, and they've created a, uh, hospitals and almshouses and and schools to help people that don't have those sorts of things. And uh, if we lack that sort of empathetic connection, uh, which is, you know, commanded by God, if we lack that, uh, what what's a good secular replacement? And I think those issues are really hard. I, don't, I think we don't have, I think without finding ways to um, to extend our uh, more deeply natural affections. I, I do think we have more deeply, nat there, are, there are exceptions sometimes, but there are exceptional exceptions sometimes that you find um, um, the sort of regard that you have for other people that, or other children that you have for your own. I think they're, you know, even in the animal kingdom, they're, they're, except not, they're not missing, but they're, but they are exceptional and, and worthy of notice. And some people sometimes have those affections. I think for most of us, they have to be cultivated. Um, and uh, so a lot, of the, a lot of my point in what I'm writing about is that we need to find ways to, uh, within our religious traditions, to actually really religiously cultivate uh, affection for people who aren't our kin and who aren't our near neighbor that benefit us. And, and as I told Joseph, I think those things are really hard. And I'm not sure uh, how successful it will be trying to come up with secular equivalents. Um, if not, then we will become more individualistic uh, and less communal. And, and in fact, that's what you're seeing today. I don't know exactly why, but I think we see people, we see, I think Americans are more individualistic. I think we're more tribal, we're more nationalistic. Uh, and as a result, we see less peace. Uh, human beings aren't flourishing as a result. Anyway, good, good points, Madavi. I'd love to talk to you sometime. Thank you, Professor Kali. Um, uh, so the last question in the chat, though, um, uh, it's from uh, Fabio Barcato, and he says, I think the following insight from Chesterton uh, may shed light on the neighbor enemy issue. The Bible tells us to love our neighbors and also to love our enemies, probably because they are generally the same people. So um, to, to make it uh, Fabio's question more clearly, um, perhaps um, we... In your view, in your reading of the Bible, Kelly, do you think there is a differentiation between uh, people? Because at, in one view, they are all from the same creator, you know? So we are 
even, even the most traditional theologian would agree that we are all children of God, God in the sense of we are creations of God, creature, creatures of God. But there is also some differentiation in the sense of some people are um, described of, of unjust, some other people describe as just. So there is some differentiation between like Jewish people and those who are Gentiles, you know. So do you see some differentiation in the Bible with regard to this, the object of love from God? Um, well, I think there's a really, uh, I think one way of reading, for example, the, the, the covenant with Abraham uh, is that everyone basically has to become a Jew and then you have to be a Zionist. And so, and there are some Jews that hold that view uh, and probably, probably a lot of them. Um, and, uh, and if they don't hold that view, um, you, you know, if that's not what, what they hold in principle, in practice, that's what a lot of Jews hold. Uh, and a lot of Christians, I think, hold that they've replaced the Jews. They're God's chosen people. America is the favored, uh, mo gets most favored nation status. Uh, and even if they think, uh, in principle, they are supposed to love other people. In fact, we think, uh, because God does, we think God really loves only us. And so it's okay for us to bomb uh, Arab children and to let people starve uh, in Yemen and for us to do things for our own good. So there's what, and, and again, I think you can, you can make a case, especially the case for the Jewish covenant. It's easier to make a case for that, um, that they are God's chosen people. Well, for what? Uh, well, God just loves them the most um, and favors them the most and doesn't really favor anybody else. Uh, but I think we see tendencies in all of our traditions for us to uh, to think that and to restrict our love. In, even if in principle we think we're supposed to love everybody, in practice we only love people that um, that look and act like us and believe like us and can mutually benefit us. Thank you. Uh, now, uh, I think we are going ahead of uh, finishing our webinar. I still have uh, one more question. I'll uh, leave the, the question to Professor Ricardo. Um, thank you again, uh, Kelly, for your willingness to uh, answer our questions, uh, talking to us. Um, I assume that you are kind of tired <laughs> uh, with all of that, but thank you. Uh, my pleasure. Uh, please, oh, Professor I, I Ricardo. Could, I could go on and on. There's lots of really good comments on people's parts. Thank you. Okay. Okay. Since you can go on and on. Okay. <laughs> Here are a more questions. And I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I, 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 I already asked four questions, perhaps. But it seems to me that much of, of, of your talk and, and also the discussion uh, uh, turn around the, the idea of basically the idea that that if someone i mean if someone's love is like more universal and less tribal so that that's 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 better so i i think that's quite quite reasonable and and of course the the, the concept the concept of a god who loves all human beings of course is, seems to be superior to to the concept of a god who i mean love just one one very specific yeah. kind of of people so i'd like to, to go back to one of my one of my questions uh more specifically about non-human beings first because i mean i think i think from an, uh, for, from an empirical point of view i think it's very very clear that like dogs cats and cows they they they, they can love or they have something very very close yeah. to what we call love in terms of their offsprings and even in terms of human beings. Uh, um, and also because since uh, uh, you, you did some kind of comparative religion, uh, of course, it dealt with just with Christianity, Islam, and, and, and Judaism. But we know that there are other religions uh, which some, it seems, it seems they, 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 they try to, 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 to include all human beings in terms of the beings 
uh, that, that God cares uh, about. And I don't know if they use the word love, but it seems that all the religions, some Eastern religions, they, they include non-human beings in the group of lovable yeah. beings. And, and again, it, it seems to me, I might be wrong, but it seems to me that, the, that in the Bible, non-human beings, they are more or less treated like, like tools, some things that, that human yeah. beings, they have the right to use. So, so my question to you, I mean, even in, both in terms of, of the Bible and also in philosophical terms, what would you have to say about that, whether or not, I mean, Christianity, if some expanded view of Christianity, uh, can human beings be included in the lovable objects or if philosophically they should? Do you have yeah. to say about that? I think so. I haven't looked into... Um, I guess I'll put it this way. The Bible was written in a context when people were lucky to get any protein at all. So um, the if they didn't eat meat, they, they were probably going to die or be unhealthy or live a shorter life. So um, so I I think it does um, it does treat by and large, it treats animals as tools like they're just for our use and our, our and for us to eat. Uh, we don't live in that world anymore. And, and we know a lot more about animals. We thought, and I think they thought there was a sharp distinction between uh, humans and animals. And now we know there's a distinction, but it's not as sharp as we thought. Like we think animals uh, have feelings. We think animals, and I, I think we should think that some animals at least uh, can love. We may overestimate that by the way, like, um, we may we may think that our dog loves us when we get home and our dog's tail is wagging, but really what the dog is saying is, I'm hungry, I'm hungry, you're my food source. Um, so sometimes I think we can we can make mistakes. There are other times when it's not so clear that uh, how how a mistake would be made, you know, uh, an, an elephant mother that returns every year to the site of its uh where his baby died and um, appears to um, show grief. Um, so um, any, at any rate, so I guess my bottom line would be this. We just know a lot more than we did before. And we, we know this too, that uh, we know that animals experience pain. And then the question is, is the aesthetic, and we know we can get uh, protein other ways, uh, is the aesthetic benefit of eating um, you know, getting the taste of meat, the, does that outweigh the pain that we cause certain animals? And it's a philosophical consideration. I can no longer eat. Uh, I'm not a vegetarian, but I, I don't eat. Um, I can't eat factory farmed meat anymore. I can't think that that's okay, an okay way to treat animals for my pleasure. So, uh, so I've made choices myself, but it's not ones that I see dictated at all by anything that I, that I, I might read in the Bible. I might, uh, oh, I might think this, uh, the Bible doesn't really say anything explicitly against slavery, um, but I might think that I've learned enough about human beings that, um, that what the Bible says about them, given what the Bible says about them, slavery is an abomination. And given that uh, animals are created by God. I, I don't have the right to to wipe them out. Or given that God made them sentient, uh, in many cases, I don't have the right to um, to treat them in various ways just for my pleasure, my aesthetic enjoyment. So, so I might think it's an extension of what I've learned from uh, theologically, uh, in a way that I learned something about slavery. Uh, by extension, yeah, even though the Bible doesn't explicitly condemn slavery. Okay, but how about God's love? I mean, uh, does God love human beings? Or if you if thinking like in, in terms of proper being theology, like would it, a, a, a God who loves human beings would be more perfect than a God who, who loves only human beings? Yeah. No, I, I think we should think God loves 
well, at least every sentient creature, and maybe in some sense, by extension, you know, I love sunsets. I love the beach. I love, the, you know, the list would go on and on where I use that term. It's not the, it's not the exact same term that I use uh, when I talk about my cat, and it's not the exact same term I use when I talk about my wife. Um, but there's there's something that's happening there there that um where what i'm saying is my love of the sunset is in some ways like the term i'm using when i say i love my wife um but it's not exactly the same but i don't think it's exactly the same uh when you talk about um i love my children i love my friends children i love all the children of the world it's just it's different in every case uh, just the same term but the uh, uh there's an appropriate effective uh uh and we need we need to explore the phenomenology for what the appro so it's not right for me to love so pedophilia isn't correct so i don't get to love my children the way i love my wife for example so it's there's certain things that um so there are appropriate affective attitudes that we should have, and they're different depending on roles, relationships, and circumstances. Um, and that will be true, I think, of uh, uh, of non-human animals and of plants and of sunsets. And um, so, yeah. So, do I think God? I think God loves the world, not just the people in the world, but the world. But but what exactly we mean by love is going to be different for each of the different things in it. Thank you. Thank you very much, all of you, again, um, uh, for your participation here. Uh, Professor uh, Kelly Clark, again, for your willingness to talk to us to answer your questions. Um, if any of you didn't have the opportunity to ask questions, please send me an email, uh, and then I can forward the email to Professor Kelly Clark. Uh, thank you again, all of you. Uh, Ali has, has some final comments. Please go ahead, Ali, and thank you again. Very nice, thank you very much. Thanks, Professor uh, Clark, and uh, Aziz and Ricardo and everyone for attending and participating in this discussion. And uh, I would like to just uh, announce that uh, our next webinar will be on February 10th by jean yves Bizet and uh, his colleagues uh, on the logic of the paradise. So join us again on February and see you soon. Thanks everyone. Bye-bye. Bye-bye everyone. Bye-bye. Take care during COVID. Guys, bye bye. Thank you all. Thank you very much.